Kit Daniels, Prison Planet. Trump has reached the number of delegates needed to clinch the GOP nomination for President Thursday after several unbound delegates flip sides. Now, again, many of you that are like I am were hesitant to support Trump because he's clearly wrong on the Fourth Amendment and Snowden and the whole waterboarding issue. However, there might actually be something that resembles a job in the freaking country if we elect Donald Trump. We can probably end NAFTA, which alone is worth voting for him for. Can he lose my vote? Yes, if he picks a Twisty Crispy as his running mate. Um, absolutely, I am not putting a, uh, a prosecutor in the White House, okay? That's like putting a, a Nazi in charge of a Jewish charity. It's probably not a good idea! Uh, Trump now has 1,238 delegates. That's one more than he needed to clinch the nomination. Um, he has 303 delegates still remaining, and there's five state primaries left, including the big whopper of California. Um, basically, at this point, the only way he could lose this would be on a second ballot. Uh, for those of you that don't know, the way it works is they have the first vote with the delegates that are bound to the candidate. He has enough bound to him on the first run that it's his. If that was to fall apart, then there would be other instances. The trouble is, if they pick somebody else, then people like me that aren't really Republican anyway, I'm far more libertarian, we're just not going to vote Republican. We're going to go back to voting for Gary Johnson like I did last time. If they do that, they're going to end up losing all of the people who were planning on voting for Trump, and they're just going to, they're probably not going to vote for Hillary. I mean, you do that, you're going to do the exact opposite of getting rid of NAFTA, because she sent more jobs overseas than uh, just about anyone. It was Bill Clinton that signed NAFTA into law, and George Bush then, of course, ratified it with him and continued it. And our jobs have been that loud sucking sound that Ross Perot warned about when he ran against them both. Um, Breitbart, more young adults live a, with a parent than a spouse or a partner. Now, the way that this is worded in the article is more like, look at all the lazy bastards living at home with their parents. That's not so much what it is here. I'm going to screen share for those of you on low def, high def. Uh, you can see it in fact cam. The, the issue here is more that we've sent all of our good jobs away, so now people that are like 18, 25-ish, they don't really have a job that's going to go anywhere. Whereas before you would have someone, let's say, in a steel plant, it starts out, he's uh, forging iron, sucking lead into his lungs and trying to get a good case of lung cancer. He may not get that lung cancer because he moves up the ladder. The trouble is that whole plant isn't here anymore, so he's working at Wendy's. It's not that the youth is incredibly lazy. It's more like America kind of sucks now. For the first time in more than 130 years of record keeping, young adults in the U.S. are more likely living with mom and dad than they are living with a spouse or a partner. 32% of millennials aged 18 to 34 were living in their parents' home in 2014 compared to 31.6% of millennial, millennials who live with a spouse or significant other. 14% of millennials live alone or else with are, they are single parents. Um, and that is the great mystery to me. It's not, that the, it's not that the youth is having sex. That has always been the case. It is more that we live in an age where birth control is handed out like Tic Tacs. I don't understand the unintended pregnancy thing here, but it seems to be playing a huge role in it, according to these numbers. Um, dating back to 1880, the most common living arrangement among young adults has been living with a romantic partner. It says whether a spouse or a significant other. 
This type of arrangement peaked in 1960 when 62% of the nation's 18 to 34 year olds were living with their spouses. Now you've got more young adults living at home than with their spouses, mainly because you really can't afford to buy a house. You don't have the job to do that, or if you do have a decent job, like I'm a DJ, the, the likelihood that you are going to replace looms behind you like the Grim Reaper. So you don't really go out on a limb a whole lot if, um, if you're trying to get something repaired. You tend to work out arrangements because you don't actually know if your job will be there tomorrow or not. So it's not so much a matter of the lazy youth as it is the screwed American. Um, this is also Breitbart. I don't normally run two in a row, but um, Civil Rights Commission finds Disney was discriminating against autistic children. The, the trouble is they weren't, and here's what's going on here. Um, I, I know Disney's guilty of a multitude of sins here. I get it. Please don't flood my comment line with it. But I don't think in this instance they've done anything wrong. What you have here are parents that have autistic children that think that their child should immediately be put to the front of the line because he is not able to wait in line. Okay, that's fine. But there are rules that go with that. And the reason I'm covering this story is because I've gone through it. Christelle, the behind-the-scenes queen, is um, always gimping herself. Um, she's a dancer, she's the singer of a band, she's busy, and she's injured. During one of the uh, times that we had passes, we buy season passes for a park called Cedar Point here in Ohio, and um, roller coaster capital of the world, she gimped herself and wasn't able to wait in line. The, her knee wasn't so bad that she couldn't ride, it was just so bad that she couldn't wait in line. So we went to the guest services and filled out this thing promising you know, not to sue them if she was wrong. And she signed that she was healthy enough to ride. And they gave her this paper. And what it did is, um, those of you that don't go to Cedar Point, this won't mean anything to you. But say it's an hour and 45 minutes to get online for the um, Maverick. What they would do is the person, at the, at the, the, the one with the stick, that makes sure your kid's tall enough. They will write, um, say it's 2 o'clock, they'll write... Um, 3.45. At 3.45, my wife and I, or I were allowed to go to the front of the line an hour and 45 minutes after we originally would have waited in line and then immediately got on the coaster. That is fine. I have no problem with that at all. If your kid's artistic or, God forbid, MRDD, my heart goes out to you, that's terrible. However... Just because your kid has a problem doesn't mean that you don't have to go through the proper channels. And that is what Disney here is getting hosed over. Um, they didn't want to wait at all. And with the preservatives like Thermosol that are kept in our vaccines, autism is on the rise. And uh, do not get the flu vaccine, friends. Unless you're very old or really young, don't get that. Um... This increased autism that's coming with us is creating a tsunami of problems, of which we're seeing here. This is from Daniel Nossbaum. If I'm not mistaken, I think this is uh, Daniel Nossbaum's first time that I've ever had him on the show. So, way to go. Um, Walt Disney Parks and Resorts discriminated against children with autism, I ask and their families by depriving them of full enjoyment of the company's theme parks of Florida Civil Rights Commission ruled this week. There's a link here on FactCam. According to Deadline, the Florida Commission on Human Relations issued five separate rulings on May 11th that found that Disney's theme park division failed to proper, properly accommodate children with autism on its Orlando, Florida parks. Um, compliant was able to demonstrate that Compliant and Complaint's son were denied a reasonable accommodation and a place of public accommodation for the son's cognitive disability. In other words, we didn't have enough sense to go to the front of the line. We just decided we were going to invite ourselves into the front of the line, cut everyone else, and nobody was going to care. And that sort of went over like a fart 
Martin Church. Friends, you're listening to The Correct Views, brought to you by Sticker Junkie. Now, why am I telling you that? Because if you go to Sticker Junkie, as I'm showing you here um, behind me, they are going to give you the best stickers you've ever seen. And you're going to get a discount if you go ahead and let them know that you heard about it on The Correct Views at checkout. I don't know if D-Like has it in there as Correct Views or The Correct Views. But if you type one and your discount doesn't come up, guess what? Type the other one. Your discount will come up. CNSnews.com, former Islamist ideology and theology, not grievances or poverty, produce radicalization. That is the most complicated ass-backwards thing ever, and the reason you didn't read the article is because it was worded so badly it bored you to death before you got through it. Unfortunately, it's important. What it is saying is you keep hearing that terrorism and bombings and beheadings and setting people on fire and shark cages is something that happens due to poverty, due to someone being held down. This study is saying that that's not the case. The problem is the teaching of the actual religion itself. Um, that's important. That's very important. The, the Muslim religion, Islam, does it tend to lend itself toward its more violent element. And uh, it might not be necessarily PC to say, but if you ask the people that were shot dead in Paris, they probably don't care much right now for political correctness, nor do their grieving families. Yes, I said it. Muslims are radicalized not because of Islamophobia, poverty, or foreign policy grievances, but because of an ideology and theology that must be uprooted if the growing problem is to be addressed, a former radical Islamist for the European Parliament said Tuesday. I think this guy just likes using words. Addressing a conference on European Muslim radical radicalization, since I can't say any words, Radicalization, Ed Hussein, a senior advisor to the Tony Blair Faith Foundation and formal Council on Foreign Relations fellow, that's not so good, urged participants to be honest about the nature of the problem. He said, um, it is not Islamophobia, because it is Muslims who are being killed most by this global extremism. In other words, it's Muslims killing other Muslims in greater numbers than it is Muslims killing Christians, at least so far. Um, therefore, he's saying the problem is actually inherent in Islam itself, in the more stringent, if you don't like what we say, we'll cut you throat element. Um, he said it isn't poverty. In fact, Osama bin Laden, as we all know, was from Saudi Arabia, and he added that there were multi-millionaires now in the ranks of Islamic State. That's not good either. Hussein, who is a practicing Muslim, it's not like he's a hater against Muslims, he is Muslim, he's trying to warn you here. He told his Brussels audience that it was convenient to argue that the radicalization was caused by Muslims' grievances over foreign policy. If it was about Western foreign policy, though, then why was Belgium attacked last month rather than Israel? Think about it. Do you think of Belgium as a great anti-Muslim nation? No, because they're not. Why'd they get attacked? He has a point there. Some of the grievances, he says, claimed by Muslims around the world were also shared by others, he said, citing India as an example. Large chunks of India have become Pakistan and Bangladesh. We don't see Indians going around trying to blow themselves up to regain lost land. Again, He's saying Hindu. He likes words. He gets lost in his own words. What he's saying is you don't see Hindus doing this. Large chunks of India. No bombs. The battle of ideas, said Hussein, is underpinned by a combination of ideology and theology. The ideology is not Islam, but Islamism. A perversion of the faith. A, pol a politici politicization of the faith, he said. Um, selfism. In other words, what our good friends in Saudi Arabia insist is such a good idea. Maybe not. All right, guys, louder with Crowder. We got two stories to go, and then I'm going to sign off here. It's 4.20 in the morning. Smoke me if you got them. More idiot parents support transgender change for a seven-year-old child. Now, I've told this story on the air before when I was really young. 
How many of you remember the, the Wonder Woman um, uh, series, TV series that was on? I was addicted to it and used to paint stars on my head. And my mother didn't call me a dumb little faggot or anything, but she was smart enough to erase it and let me know that I was a little boy. She did not encourage me to be a little girl. Um, nor did she ban me from watching Wonder Woman, which is the uh, other terrible thing a parent can do. That'll just make them watch it more. Um, the problem here is you don't tell a seven-year-old child that thinks he is a girl, or vice versa, that he is, okay, I understand that there are gay people in the world. I don't have a problem with it. I'm not, but I won't turn off two women who's with me. But the, the bigger problem here is you don't try to tell a seven-year-old child that he's gay or that he was born with the wrong gender. I'm sorry, that's child abuse. Um, does it seem like more transgender kids keep sprouting up each year? Because there are now more transgender children than ever, and uh, Crowder links it here. Making transgender people de facto heroes in our pop culture could be a reason for the spike. And again, I have always said that uh, the beautiful Christelle and I may have a relationship that other people would not find morally acceptable. That's fine. These people are trying to make you accept what they want, whether you like it or not. That's a step too far. I don't think we should be beating their asses in the street or anything, but this is going too far. Widespread child awareness is encouraged in the hopes that you'll be lucky enough to have one to add to your all-inclusive child collection. That's why trans kids are always thrown in front of the camera. Quick question, if a boy puts on a skirt in a woman's bathroom and nobody is around to film it, is he still transgender? Of course he is. You're a bigot. The seven-year-old boy girl is a great example of society's recent move to emblazon transgenderism as heroic. The she-he started transforming at six, as in one, two, three, four, five, six years on the planet Earth. I love the way he writes. The parents promptly corrected his behavior. Just kidding. No, they went on BBC News and got a mini-documentary, started to commemorate the occasion. Now, Lily's most personal and embarrassing details have been globally publicized. This is what Lily, the six-year-old boy, says about wearing a skirt. Um, it felt a bit natural, but mostly embarrassing, because the tights were making me itch a lot, and it stopped becoming embarrassing after a while. Listen to how Crowder words this, my friends. Is anybody actually listening to this kid? He's complaining about being uncomfortable. Not comfortable. There is no light bulb on the tranny kind moment here. He's not saying after I put on the skirt everything clicked and I felt right. What he just said was I stopped, it stopped being embarrassing after a while. Yeah, that's what happens when you lose the last embrace semblance of dignity, kid. You tuck in your willy between your legs and you move on. This is child abuse. He is being emotionally prepared for castration by his parents. And one day they will realize it. Um, here's another point we need to address. Ever since the ever single transgender child's parent acts like they have no control over what their kids does. Newsflash, kids think weird crap. There's a reason we don't let them make lifelong decisions when they're seven or eight. Heck, I knew an eight-year-old who wanted to grow up to be an alligator. Transspeciesism, perhaps. No, imagination, yes. Though he did develop horrible psoriasis, so in the end I suppose he got his wish. However, you, the parents, are supposed to set the rules for the children, not the other way around. And guys, that brings us to the dumb dee of the day. The Dumb Dee of the Day is brought to you by KSR Records. Link, give a shout out to KSR Records. Hey, hey, hey! We got Link in the studio. Uh, we got the You Are the Idiot song playing in the background. Not for Link, but for this wonderful dolt that we're... I'm just going to let it play as I give the report. It's that stupid. BizPack Review, Scott Moorefield, if I let it play too long, they won't let me monetize it. The Citadel has an epic reply to Muslim women who wants military dress code changed to... No, wait, let me get this. I have to give this to you correctly. Hold on. 
She wants it changed to the hijab. She wants a burqa to be worn as military dress. That way your brother in arms can't tell whether you're the enemy or the friend. In the level, in the world of stupid, this one, this is kingdom here. Last month at the Citadel, so I can't even believe I'm doing, I'm not going to be able to do this with a straight face, South Carolina's military college, an incoming Muslim female student put in a request to wear a hijab, a female Muslim head covering as part of her uniform. Even though the school has never in all their history granted any sort of accommodation to their very strict dress code, officials said they would consider the request. All right, now look, you see this hair? The military would cut this hair off of me faster than you would stop your kid from wearing a dress if you were sane. But no, if I wanted to wear a hijab and claimed I was a woman, then they'd probably let me keep the hair. I have never seen anything like this. The incoming student got her answer on Tuesday. She should have gotten a straight jacket on Tuesday. It said the answer was a big fat no. Citadel President Lieutenant General John Rosa issued the following statement on the side of logic. While we hope the student will enroll in the college this fall, the Commandant of Cadets, after considerable review, determined the uniform exception cannot be granted. The standardization of cadets in apparel, it goes on, overall appearance, actions, and privileges is essential to the learning of goals and objectives. Let me put that in English. You cannot wear the uniform of the enemy and be in the army, dipshit! Council on American-Islamic Relations spokesman Ibrahim Hooper had called on the school to send a message of inclusion because tolerance and diversity and hate and all of that jazz. Hooper then went on to insist that M M Mennonite women wouldn't face the same obstacles, which is hilarious, because Mennonites are pacifists, and they aren't any records of Mennonites being beaten down doors to get into the Citadel. In other words, Mennonites will not fight you if you fight them. They'll just pretty much let you defeat them. You might be able to get the male to defend his family, but otherwise they won't fight back. They're the most peaceful people ever. And that is why that analogy in the entire story wins the dumdy of the day. Guys, Sam I.B. DeGangie signing off. I'll be back on Saturday, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on The Media Speaks. This is brought to you by Change Transportation. If you were going to call Uber, do me a favor. Save yourself some money and don't. Call Change Transportation, and there will be price match Uber. And if they have anyone in the area, you're going to save a fortune. And you're going to save more by saying, hey, dispatch your person. I listen to the correct views. Sam guy. And you're going to get a discount on top of the discount you got by not calling Uber. That's like twice. Good night, friends. God bless, and thank you for listening.